So, um, welcome um, to the um, Pacific uh, B2 session of the MRI Together workshop. So, my name is Cornelius Faber, and uh, I'm chairing this session from Germany with my um, co chair Ludger Starke from Berlin, also Germany. And um, this is about reproducibility, um, phantoms, and preclinical. And it seems that um, some people, in particular two of the speakers, um, have trouble, still technical trouble, joining the session. So we will um, um, switch the order of the presentations. So please um, mind that the sessions, uh, the session is recorded. And um, if you have any questions, then um, please type them into the chat uh, and make sure that your chat settings um, is not a direct message to uh, one of the board, but to everyone, so everyone can see the session. And um, with that, um, Ludger, hand over to Ludger. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Cornelius. Uh, I'm really excited about this session. Um, co collaboration in preclinical MRI is a really important topic, I guess, so that we can uh, get more out of our data and all, all of the time we spend doing research. Um, I had the pleasure to uh, speak with uh, Juanes, I hope I pronounced it kind of correct, uh, two months ago, nearly, at the ESMRMB. That was a great panel already, and I think he has the right tools for our field of research. Um, so I'm. Uh, let's welcome Juanes, and uh, I'm happy to hear about collabor collaborative work on preclinical pre MRI. Uh, hi, thank you both of you for inviting me to, to this session. It's my pleasure. Uh, let me get the thing started. Very good. <clears throat> uh, so I uh, switched my title to uh, cross site efforts in preclinical imaging, and I think that's a new way forward. And I think with this talk, I want to explain why I think that's the way to go. Uh, but also what are the major challenges that we're facing uh, in doing this and how we can resolve these. Uh, and I like to start my uh, talks always with a painting um, and this one uh, is really showing teamwork toward achieving uh, the goal of one hunt. And I think that illustrates um, how we need to work together if we want to achieve our mission. Um, first thing first, I have uh, no conflict uh, to disclose for this presentation and um, and I make this presentation available on a CCBY license. So I'm a neuroscientist, so uh, I will have uh, this presentation, which has, of course, this angle throughout, but I will not make too much of a use case and, and, and too much discussions about neuroscience specifically. I think things uh, apply to the whole uh, preclinical world. Um, if we look to our neighbors uh, who work with human participants, the biggest success story, at least in neuroscience, um, are the advents of large uh, data sets that have been generated. Um, and here are four such large data sets, the human connectum, which contains to date uh, the data for 1,200 participants, uh, including resting state, structural MRI and diffusion MRI at three Tesla and sometimes even um, seven Tesla. Uh, the UK Biobank now is just a massive data set that contains uh, imaging for over 10,000 participants together with um, genotypes and, and, and a lot of other rich metadata. And then we have a disease specific data set like the uh, Alzheimer's Neuroimaging uh, Initiative data set or the Enigma for psychiatry. Uh, and just to give you a sense of how important they are. This is, um, I've plotted here, the uh, citations or the dimensions on PubMed for the human connectum uh, related publications. And you see that on average now every year, over a thousand uh, publications use the human connectum data sets uh, to tell a new story about the brain. Um, so these have a massive impact and, and they achieve that because of the size of the data set uh, that they've collected. 
us working on the preclinical domain are a bit more of a niche publication. Um, in a publications we made last year, I went through and I counted each and every animal fMRI paper I could find. So this is not representative of the entire field, but just our subdomain. Um, but even then, we, we barely achieve uh, 150 or so uh, publications uh, per year, um, which is about uh, a tenth of what uh, the human connectome itself achieves, if you, if you think about this. Um, and the other thing that needs to be noted is the sample size that we tend to include in our studies. Um, with uh, primates, of course, being at the lower ends of the sample size uh, for reasons that are quite obvious. It's quite difficult to maintain primate colonies and, and to have them of a large size would be hard to imagine. Um, if you go for larger mammals like cats, dogs, pigs, uh, also sample size tends to be on the low ends. And of course, more um, or cheaper animals like rats and rodents allow us tend to have larger sample size, but even then, um, the median number of rats uh, per studies is, is barely above 10, so we don't necessarily use large sample size. And this is not just our community, and um, this is a paper that was uh, published in Nature Neuroscience last year, which I find very inspiring as well. Um, and, and they did something similar for the whole field of animal behavior in neuroscience, so it's not imaging related. Um, but they also arrived to the same number uh, of rodents used, which is about 10 animals per group. Uh, but what they did is also, uh, these papers generally uh, relate to trying to determine group differences between animals. And so they present that difference as an effect size, um, a standardized effect size. Um, and these are standard values to determine uh, the magnitude of a difference between two groups. Um, with generally uh, anything below 0 0.5 uh, should be considered a, a small effect. And actually what they do find is the vast majority of the studies actually do um, indicate that differences between all groups of animals tend to be small most of the time. Uh, if you take that information into account and you, you do a so-called power analysis, the uh, retrospective power analysis, you do find um, that most of the studies that people have been performing are largely underpowered. Um, and this is quite consistent with all the studies that have been done in neuroscience and other areas of biomedical sciences, where we aim when we write our uh, grants applications and our animal ethics uh, approval, that we do power calculations aiming for 80%. But what we typically achieve is 20%. What that means is that our data sets are inflated in false negatives. Uh, and this is very likely because indeed we have uh, animal group size that are much too small um, and effects are much too small. Uh, all of these combined uh, just makes our study uh, irreproducible. I think the, 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 some of the papers that got me the most excited recently in animal neuroscience, and again, this is not imaging, um, are uh, studies that try to achieve meta-analysis, uh, which is the gold standard in uh, evidence-based medicine. Uh, but these are rarely performed in animal studies. I can think of only two such papers. So this is one, and then there's another one, where people went through painstakingly a list of publications and then extracted the effect size uh, for specific comparisons. This is related to uh, behaviors of animals in animal models uh, related to stress and, and depressive disorders using very standardized uh, tests that are common in most neuroscience labs. Um, and if you aggregate the information from multiple papers, then you start to see uh, a true value or a true effect um, that, uh, that pertains to, to that specific manipulations. Interestingly as well is represented in the so-called triangular plots where uh, the effect of individual studies are plotted. Uh, and these are kind of hard to read or to interpret for, if, for, for people who are unfamiliar with. Um, 
but these plots allow in theory to indicate the evidence for uh, publication biases that we tend to have in our studies. And the theory wants that 95% of the dots ought to be within the white triangle. Um, but for some specific cases, and, and again, this is related to stress disorders, so not relevant to everyone. But for instance, this is a knockout for a specific gene in, in, uh, related to serotonin. And there's actually much more uh, studies that fall outside of the white triangle than the 95% that are predicted. And this is indicative of uh, publication biases. For instance, people who do not publish negative results or uh, people who tend to, to publish extremely large uh, effects when the sample size that they have would not allow them to, to, to reveal these kind of effects or to make them uh, vulnerable to false positives. So, so this is really something fantastic. And that's something I wish in maybe 10 years from now we would be able to do in our community. At the moment, we're not even there yet. Um, and uh, the best we are at uh, is just trying to talk to one another and, and get together. And these meetings are fantastic about this. Um, this is uh, an example of a multi-center initiative uh, that was performed in France, uh, also published last year. Uh, where they asked a very simple question, which is, what is the T1 and T2 relaxation values in the rat brain? And so they brought a batch of rats and they carried it to two research center and then they imaged the rats. Uh, and then uh, purple represents one center and then green represents the other centers. Um, and they also examine other parameters such as uh, analysis. And they do uh, comparisons with other studies. Uh, and this, this is a great start just to get us to agree on very basic principles. Unfortunately, I come from a specific domain that is extremely complicated and that involves a lot of steps, uh, and that's a functional MRI. Uh, I was maybe lucky to be at the very beginning when functional MRI uh, at rest was kicking in for uh, mice in particular, uh, and I was surrounded by, by many other uh, colleagues and, and friends. Um, and we were all rushing into these fields. And, and, and at the beginning, there was a lot of confusions about what results ought to be. Uh, and some of the arguments that we were having, for instance, was if the difference was related to the pre-processing pipelines, because everyone was making his or her own pipeline in his lab. Um, and so we wouldn't know if differences that we were observing between our data sets was due to pipeline or not. Um, and uh, that's how I got to perform my first multi-center study, which was um, uh, to aggregate 17 different mouse fMRI data sets and make a comparisons through a unified pipeline. And that was quite informative and quite revealing in showing that it was not necessarily the pre-processing that was having such a large effect, but indeed there were great differences uh, between data sets. And here I showed two examples at the, uh, at the opposing end of the spectrums. Uh, and then these color codes show what we aim for in, in fMRI, which is the so-called functional connectivity, where we do show, uh, in one case, a beautiful so-called resting state network, which is what we're interested in our domain. Um, whereas the other data sets fails to reveal uh, that uh, element in itself. So, so the, the biology that we can detect and that we can infer from these data sets are quite different and, and we need to be made aware of that. About two years ago, I was um, challenged to do a follow-up to this study and, and I've been trying and I, I want to, and this one has grown in size um, much more than what I expected. And so I want to show you some of the challenges that I faced and some of the technologies that I've uh, um, and it, that I've used to, to make this uh, study possible. Um, so this time it's about the rat, uh, and this study has grown to, uh, at the moment, about 150 collaborators from 20 different countries. I've accumulated 53 resting state data sets uh, in the rat, uh, containing 600 and something scans, so we can also do test retests. Uh, we also have an additional 12 data sets uh, for stimulus evoked fMRI, which is another way of doing fMRI. Um, and we've also have a group of labs that have agreed generously to perform new experiments for this study. Uh, and at the moment I've collected, uh, I've 
uh, gathered uh, between eight and, and 12 such data sets where we've agreed collectively on a, on, a, on a protocol and we all try to run the same protocol across the different labs. Uh, this is 100 gigabytes of unprocessed data and, and a few uh, terabytes of processed data and it's countless hours on a supercomputer. Uh, and actually at the moment, I'm just running 600 jobs on a supercomputer um, during the night. So it's, it, is, it, it is something that takes a little bit of logistics to be uh, organized. Uh, this is a representation of the country and actually I was quite excited to, to talk tonight at the Pacific time um, because this is typically an area that I've failed uh, to reach uh, in, my, in my previous request for data sets, so uh, maybe this will change. Uh, it tends to be a very Europe-centric and, and mostly uh, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, uh, but we have also other partners uh, elsewhere in Europe, but also in Asia and Australia. Uh, I don't want to bore you with the details of the study in itself, because I, I understand not everyone is a neuroscientist and no one is, is, is fully uh, excited about that study uh, for these reasons. Um, but it's quite interesting just to, to see how even people work with different strains of uh, rats in that particular case. We, of course, have the male bias that we find in all of our studies all the time, and, and we should be getting read off uh, at a certain time. Um, it's also interesting to see who works at what fields, and, and of course, the 7 Tesla and 9.4 Tesla tends always to be the, the most represented data sets. Um, what I'm doing, and that's the only slide about uh, the work in itself, uh, we're trying to determine uh, what parameters will rule uh, specific biological characteristics, um, and in a nutshell, we want to have as many scans that looks like this one example and that fall within that category uh, but among the few hundred scans that we've gathered only 30 percent fall within that category and we're trying to learn how we can improve that um, but what i want to talk to you and, and finish my talk about is really what it takes to organize this entire study and the first thing that i did uh, which i learned from my previous study was to do a pre-registration and this is supposed to be the gold standard in in open science i've uh, and, and I want to promote that with this study, but I also use that as an insurance policy. And I think when you start working with large groups, this is something you might have to think about. Um, because if I have 150 co-author on my paper and each of them start requesting their own sets of experiments that they wish they would see from my study, I would never be able to put an end to this. So it's another way of justifying why, why people should be uh, doing pre-registrations. Um, the second thing also uh, is the enormous efforts that such studies takes uh, in terms of software development. And for that, I'm quite lucky uh, to have collaborators at McGill University who've developed uh, a fantastic piece of software for rodent uh, fMRI processing. Um, and, and the other thing is quality control and quality assurance. Um, these are two images that are output from the software I've just mentioned above. And these are showing uh, registrations of anatomical images onto a template or functional images onto the template. Um, and doing such large studies means also verifying the quality of all the data that gets in and every little step of the processing. So such images I've had to look at, many of them, 600 of them, every other days uh, until I got a pre-processing pipeline that works. Uh, the final, uh, one of the additional thing I've done is, is working really hard to make the code um, available, but also try to describe the code. So I do not want to spam all my 150 uh, co-authors on the study on a regular basis to inform them about the code. But what I've done was to have a GitHub repository um, and have all the code so that all my co-authors can also um, audit my work, can examine what I'm doing, follow my results. Uh, but also, this is a resource that I give to everyone in the community so that I can make sure other researchers can reach the same level of analysis uh, without having the prior coding experience that I have. Um, and, and the direct output of, of our study uh, was that we've 
been sitting together and based on what we've learned from the first part of the study, we've been able to propose a standardized acquisition protocol, um, which is quite simple to run. And, and we've had a few labs and are running it and very soon we'll know how effective it was. So I'm quite excited about this. So uh, in summary, uh, what I want to discuss is, is really these large studies, uh, in addition to being powered by human beings and human interactions and a lot of emails, are also powered by technological advancements. Um, and these are technical advancements, um, mostly on, on IT sides, which I believe are skills that we should try to equip as much as possible our PhD students, because these are also transferable skills that it can use not only in our labs, but also if they move uh, to different labs and outside of academia, where these skills are highly in, in high demand. Um, how can you do your part? Um, that's uh, how I'm going to conclude. Um, I think if we wanna to work together, then we have to, to sort of do our, our best. And if we are in this meeting, I think we all are willing to, um, and of course, uh, accurate study reporting is, is the bare minimum that we should expect from anyone nowadays, but it's not even so trivial because still screening the literature, it's always difficult sometimes to identify group size or uh, sex of the animals. Uh, proper QA uh, quality control uh, should, should be done by every study. I strongly argue that in 2021, we should be able to share our data, each and every one of us, but even then that's a fight. Uh, but I hope in the future that we can convince each other that sharing code and doing peer registration and also working toward reproducible software environments uh, will help um, us working together and understanding how we do our work. Uh, final slide uh, is I want you to send me your data sets if you're doing fMRI. I'm always uh, interested uh, in chatting with you, helping you set up things. And if you can, if I can enroll you in my studies, then um, I would. Um, and of course, I can't do this work alone. And as I said, there's a lot of people working with me. Um, this is the, the whole list. Uh, but there are a, a few uh, particular people, uh, especially uh, my collaborators at McGill University, who are doing fantastic work. Um, and that's it for me. Thanks a lot, uh, Johannes, for this, for this uh, fantastic presentation. We have some feedback in the sound right now. Uh, I think it's not me. Oh, I don't know. You see, we have uh, Tom Yankilov joining us. That's great. It was a hard fight. OK, thank you. But <laughs> I think we should discuss uh, Joe's talk first. So uh, Joe, thank you very much. I, um, uh, we, we tried to solve uh, the technical problems in the background, but it seems we were at least partly successful. So, okay, um, are there questions? Um, we have one question in the chat. Um, yeah. So, uh, Wolfgang Duczek asks, uh, how can we do a quick quality control? So, do you have um, your heuristics? Um, do you write it down what you look for in the quality control? Yeah, so... For quality control, the, the basics, I mean, image registrations um, that we rely a lot in neuroimaging. Um, and so that can be done with the plots I've shown. I tend not to be dogmatic about other, some specific parameters until I have proof that they are quite relevant. Uh, so that would be, for instance, signal to noise ratio or even breathing rate. I, I've had many uh, collaborators coming to me telling me, my data set ought to be good because breathing rate is why. And then I have other people coming to me and say, my data set is going to be great because my breathing rate is X. Um, and there's, I don't think there's evidence that breathing rate is going to determine how good your data set is going to be. So, so we have to be quite uh, dogmatic about these. And, but I hope that with aggregating very large data sets and we can identify better predictors. So this quality control is something you do after your first pre-processing steps. You don't have a way of doing it right after acquiring the data right now. Um, if you're in a hurry, what I always say is run for fMRI, at least run a quick ICA. And if you see plausible network in your individual scans, you're good to go. If you're not, you might need a little bit of scrubbing. And if you don't see anything after scrubbing, um, you're in trouble. 
Okay, I, uh, perhaps I can just add there. I mean, um, so what? What? So what is actually? Um, well, um, yeah. I mean, it's basically this, the last question was what are the, the the quick things? But how important is the, the SNR, the TSNR, um, that you see in the or that you have in the data set? It's it's not been a one to one great predictor. So it's not that great. TSNR is, is going to guarantee great data. It's, it's no silver bullet. I think it, it and, and that's, I come to these meetings and I'm a biologist and I realize that the generation before me and, and I see you Cornelius uh, are people who come with uh, MR and physics background and, and people like these easy, well, easy numbers, SNR, TSNR, so that's what you've what we've been trained to use. Uh, but when it comes to fMRI specifically, but I think that might be applicable to other, other, other domains as well, it's the biology eventually that, that really matters. And, and um, sometimes biology cannot just be reduced to that simple number. Okay, yeah, well, I mean, I mean, biology is much more complicated than a few simple numbers, but um, yeah, I mean, always to me, it appeared that, that the kind of SNR is like a prerequisite that, um, uh, I, well, we had this discussion before, it seems that it's um, not the only number or not, not the least, uh, the most important number. Yeah. I think okay, we have okay. one more question. I think it was from uh, Emily really? who was asking, uh, yeah, I rely on people who generously um, empty their drawers and send me whatever they have in their drawers most of the time. And when we started a, a de novo acquisition, again, I rely on the generosity of all of my collaborators and they've been infinitely uh, generous in, in providing scan time and manpower and animals in each of the labs for that study. Um, but I think these then provide the justifications. The fact that we are able to organize one another justifies, uh, helps us justify going to funding agencies and, and ask for a bigger share of money if we've shown that we've worked together toward a greater goal. Maybe I can add a quick question. Um, you showed that uh, the post-processing pipeline differences are not the cause of these different results you see in mice. So what is your feeling right now? Uh, what is the cause? Is it on the hardware side or is it in the animal handling? As a biologist, I'm compelled to say it's the physiology. It's always been the physiology. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I have evidence of people with very old, low quality MRI scanners who managed to get signal that looks acceptable and, and people with the latest highest field and and that might not have allowed them to get the same signal so so there is something about the physiology but that might be again very specific to this use case and and people doing for instance diffusion tensor imaging uh, and other applications in other body parts might not suffer as much from physiology during the measurements uh, as we are when we do functional imaging Thanks a lot. Yeah, okay. So Joe, thank you very much for this uh, fantastic presentation. And I mean, this is really very important, uh, particularly for our work, as you know. 